Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said to them, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. And they came and held him by the foot and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And so while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, bribing them, saying, Telling, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. And so they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this still is reported to this day amongst the Jews. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we're not going to look at that particular account. Um, I want us to think more broadly today about the resurrection. But before we move on from Matthew 28, just notice how Matthew keeps emphasizing the word to see. And uh, you have it repeated again and again throughout this passage. Either you'll get the word behold, which is a command to look, or you just get the simple um, word to see being stressed. Um, you just need to look down the passage, and there it is. It's in verse 1, it's in verse 2, it's in verse 6. This idea of seeing, seeing the risen Jesus uh, on this particular day. One more thing, then, before we move on. You have at the end of Matthew's Gospel what some people refer to as uh, the Great Commission. The idea that you have in verse 19 of going into all the world uh, to make disciples. All I really want you to think about there <clears throat> is the gospel is ending in a reverse fashion to the way that it began. So do you remember uh, in the birth narrative, you get the, the, the wise men coming from the east. They are coming from a country into Jerusalem. And uh, the end of the gospel is going from Jerusalem and then into the world. So this thing that we call the commission is simply a, a way of saying that with the resurrection of Jesus, the position has re been reversed. It used to be the case that people would have to travel to Jerusalem to find truth. So you have the Queen of Sheba, for example, traveling to meet Solomon. You have all this idea of, of uh, if you want to find God, you've got to go uh, to Jerusalem where the, where the temple is. 
now with the resurrection of Jesus, that entire situation has changed. And now God is going from Jerusalem out into the world uh, to bring people the news of, of Jesus Christ. So it's the, the change that has been brought about by the resurrection. Okay, then so let's think more generally about what the resurrection of Jesus um, tells us. And I want to think of, in classic sermon fashion, I want to think about three points, okay? So following the example of the Apostle Paul, who always seemed to have had three points to all his sermons, I want us to think this morning about the purpose of the resurrection. Let's then think about the power of the resurrection. And then the third is the promise of the resurrection. So again, not only do I have three points, each point begins with the same letter. So hopefully that's just a way of uh, reminding ourselves of what we are thinking about this morning. So we'll think about the purpose of the re resurrection, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of the resurrection. So if you were to ask the question then, what's the purpose of the resurrection? Um, we'd have different answers from all of us. I think in light of what we've been saying recently about looking at our Bibles to find God, then to me, the first, the primary purpose of the, the resurrection of Jesus is it's a revelation about who God is. It is telling us a fundamental truth about our God. And that fundamental truth is God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And this idea is one of the most fundamental ideas we can hold in our thoughts about who God is. He is not the God of the dead. God is not the God of decline. He is not the God of decay. He is not the God of ends. Uh, he's not the God of failure. God is the living God. And uh, <clears throat> I want just to offer one or two scriptures, if I can, as we go along with these, these points, to, to help reinforce the idea. So God is the God of the living, and he's not the God of the dead. Turn to Matthew and uh, chapter 22. And in Matthew 22, we've got um, the, the Sadducees trying to trick Jesus um, in their conversation with him about the, the nature of the resurrection. So Matthew 22, and from verse 23 to verse 33. Now, you remember the, this occasion. The Sadducees were this grouping in Israel, who did not believe in the unseen world. They were materialists. Um, so they had no room in their thinking for the unseen, the invisible, the supernatural. They were, if you like, uh, very modern. They believed in what you could see. And so they invent this um, uh, story to try and show the absurdity of the the idea of resurrection and when jesus answers them he says in verse 32 quoting i am the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob god is not the god of the dead he is the god of the living now that quote is from exodus chapter 3 exodus chapter 3 verse 6 Exodus chapter 3 and verse 15, where Moses encounters God in the desert. He has the burning bush, do you remember? And God gives him a revelation, a revelation of the fact that he is the living God. He's not a God of history. He's not the God of the past. He, he's not some God of fairy tale and legend and myth. He is the living God. And Moses encounters that living God and is then empowered by the living God to go to the people of Israel and offer them hope and deliverance. So the first thing then about today, the, the primary message of any Easter or any Sunday for, uh, for that is that God is not the God of the dead. 
Now, you and I are living at a time when church life is difficult, when there's few of us, when we are not seeing much, when all our conversation is about the decline of the church, how the membership of the church is getting older, how we're all getting weaker and feebler. Our conversation is coloured by this idea that, that, that God is almost someone who belongs to the past, that before was better, and that now we're in the, this condition of sad decline. The resurrection tells us very clearly then that God is not the God of dead individuals. God is not the God of a declining church. God is not the God who's confined to some past. He is the living God. God, our God, is as much the God of today as he has been the God of the past, as he has been the God that we read of in our Bibles, the living God. That's what we need our focus to be on, on the fact that our God is the living God. And uh, the resurrection is proof of that. So bear this in mind now in the coming days. Bear this in mind when we get back to normal, whatever normal is, when we start meeting together uh, in our congregations and as we look around at each other uh, and we count how many of us are present and, and we look at our ages and we look at our conditions and, uh, and we start to, to lose heart. God is the living God. That's the message of the resurrection. So let's think together also about the power uh, of the resurrection. And can we think of that in at least three ways, okay? The power of the resurrection. And uh, I want to do it like this. First of all then, in the resurrection of Christ, we see the power of God at work. Now, many times um, over the years, we've, we've emphasized the love of God. And it's absolutely right that we do so. But if the love of God was not equaled by the power of God, then God's love would be ineffective. He may feel, he may care, he may have compassion. But if God is not also the God of power, then God would not be able to do anything. His love would be unexpressed. His love would be ineffectual. So the resurrection is the emphasis on the power of God at work. It's the same power that you see in the acts of creation that open the Bible in the book of Genesis. The power of God that is expressed through command. So you have, don't you, in Genesis, God spoke and it was. And it's the word of God that captures the power of God. It's the word of God that gives rise to an expression of God's power. And so on, on the Resurrection Sunday, uh, in a way that was unheard by the world, God spoke. And the result of God speaking was that Christ was raised from the dead. That he was physically, literally raised from the dead. Now, one of the things we could do, uh, not just today now, but at any time, is think about the resurrection of Jesus and what occurred in that moment of resurrection. So if we do so just for a moment together, Jesus Christ is God and man, two natures joined in one person. And at the cross, those um, two natures remained joined, but in his human nature, soul and body were separated. So the body laid in the tomb was joined to the divine nature and the soul that was separated from the body remained joined to the divine nature. Now, this might be hard going, okay? But bear with me. In the resurrection of Jesus, his soul was reunited to his body 
And that act of re being reunited was at the command of God. And as soul and body were reunited, the body of Jesus was transformed and became a glorious body. The power of God reuniting soul and body and then transforming that body into a glorious body. You see the power of God in the resurrection of Jesus. Now we'll say a bit more about that in a second or so, but just hold on to the idea then that the human soul of Jesus, the human body of Jesus were reunited in that moment by the power of God. And it became a transformation so that that dead body, not only was it made alive, but it was transformed and became a glorious body. The power of God in the resurrection of Jesus. Well, if we think of the power of God in resurrection, then I want you to next turn to Ephesians and chapter two. So if you're still with me, give me a wave, okay? Yeah, wonderful, that's a great wave, guys. We'll have to introduce that on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Let's turn to Ephesians and uh, chapter two. And what you have in Ephesians two is the power of God in the resurrection of the Christian. This is sometimes referred to as the first resurrection or the spiritual resurrection. So Ephesians 2, and uh, let's read from verse 4. Now God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You and I, if we're Christian people, we have already experienced resurrection. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, we must never, ever underestimate that. We were dead without Christ, without hope. And then the same power that raised Jesus in the tomb raised you and I out of our spiritual deadness. We have experienced the same resurrection. And uh, what Paul tells you in Ephesians 2 is that we were raised together with Christ. And in fact, we have been made to sit in the heavenly places alongside Jesus. We have been resurrected. And uh, this, this Ephesians epistle is essentially a prayer letter. Um, Paul writing to all the churches that he is praying for them. And he wants them to understand that the same power that raised them from the dead is continuously at work in their lives. Day by day, every believer experiences that resurrection power of God in our lives making us sufficient for our circumstances. That's the burden of this prayer letter. So look at the, the first uh, chapter. And the prayer begins, as you know, in verse 15. Therefore, I, after I heard of your faith, I do not cease to give thanks, verse 16. But go down um, to the, the, the verse 19. And there is Paul saying, I'm praying that you understand the greatness of the power of God, which is at work in us who believe the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Verse 20. You know, you and I can feel very weak. And we can feel very fragile. And we've been emphasizing in recent times, haven't we, that the now life that we live, this Christian life, it's lived in the flesh. 
it's a life marked out by weakness and struggle. But at the same time, the power of God, the resurrection power of God, is continuously at work, strengthening us, enabling us, empowering us, being infused into our inner man so that we are equal to uh, whatever the demands that, that face us. And here's Paul now from prison, writing this prayer letter, encouraging Christian people to understand the nature of the wor work of God in our continuous experience. Can you see Paul is emphasizing God's work? He's not saying, now, come on, you do this, you do that. He's lifting our vision to God and saying, God is exceedingly great power. Is that work, that resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead? And in fact, Paul gets so excited when he's telling these Christians that they are to understand the power of God that's at work in us, that he actually loses track. Uh, and uh, in verse 21 of the first chapter, Paul goes off on one, doesn't he? He's gone off on a sidetrack <clears throat> in which he's, he's rejoicing in the power of God that has raised Christ into heaven and has raised us from the dead and has seated us with Christ in the glory. And Paul doesn't come back to his prayer report until chapter three because he's been so ecstatic about the nature of the power of God that's at work in our lives. So resurrection, it's the uh, power of God in Christ. It's the power of God in our first resurrection. But then of course, we'd have to say, wouldn't we, that the resurrection of Jesus is pointing forward to the power of God that will be on display in the second resurrection, the, the, the glorious resurrection. You know the chapter, 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Let's just take a look at that, shall we? We know this chapter really well. 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 15. And again, <clears throat> there were those in Corinth, a bit like the Sadducees, I guess, who began to question the nature of the physical, literal, actual idea of resurrection. And Paul has to address that in chapter 15. And then as the chapter draws to a close, you have Paul revealing to us the mystery of the final glorious resurrection. <clears throat> Behold, verse 51, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, those words are, are so perfect, aren't they? The power of God will raise you and I from the dead. So let's think back to the resurrection of Jesus. His soul, his human soul, was reunited with his physical body. That body had been decaying in the tomb. His soul was reunited to his physical body. And in that moment of reunion, he was made alive, but the body of Christ was glorified. There'll come a day <clears throat> when, and let, let's, let's leave to one side now, those will be alive at the time. But there'll, there'll come a day when the trumpet of God will sound. And if we have died, our physical remains, in whatever condition they'll be, our physical remains will be reunited with our soul and our physical bodies will be changed. That decay will be transformed and we will be made alive, but we will be glorified. That's going to happen to you and I. Whatever lies ahead for us, the fact is we've had in Christ the first fruits. We've had the, the proof 
of what our destiny will be. So that if we do, before this great event, if we do die, however the manner of our death, whatever the circumstances of our death, it doesn't even matter how long between our death and the second coming of Christ, it doesn't matter, that physical remains will be reunited with our soul and we will be glorified. That's our future. And if we are alive when the trumpet sounds, then the same will occur. We will be changed. Now, the word change is the word metamorphosis. It's a, it's a, it's a radical transformation of what already exists. The power of God to raise all those who sleep, to raise all those who remain alive, to transform the universe, to bring in a new heaven and a new earth, that power of God, which will be made manifest when Christ returns mm -hmm. for a second time. That's the power of God in the resurrection. So let me take a breath and let's do a recap. The purpose of the resurrection is to tell us that God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could regain a confidence in the truth that God is the living God, that he is our God, that the God we read of, the, the God we hear about, the God who, who has worked throughout history is our God. There has been no change in him. There is no alteration of his purpose. There has been no abandonment of his plans. There has been no diminution of God's um, power and glory. He is our God and he's the living God. He, he's not confined to the pages of history. He is our God. And then in the resurrection of Christ, we have the power of God on display, a power that continues to work and a power that will one day bring about immortality uh, into our creation. You and I will be revealed as the sons of God. It's the moment that creation is waiting for, the power of God. Well, let's think then of, of uh, the, the promise of the resurrection. And uh, I want to do this in a passage that I've always thought is a wonderful passage, but I've also found it a very difficult passage to speak on. And uh, I don't know why that is. Perhaps other people find it easier than I do. But it's 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 1. So if you're still there, turn to 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. And uh, a few verses in this first chapter, uh, I think we can immediately identify with. God is the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Verse 3. God comforts us in our tribulation. Now go down to verse 8. Okay, so 2 Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, you and I might be able to identify with that at the moment. Some people are feeling, aren't they, burdened beyond measure in this present crisis. We think especially of those who are frontline NHS staff, burdened by the demands of caring for others. You and I may feel the burden of self-isolation, the burden that every day feels the same, um, that you wake up and uh, you have another day in paradise, the paradise of self-isolation. So, so this sense of being burdened is one that I'm sure many of us are feeling right now. And that sense of burden can make you doubt your own strength, the, the, the strength to cope and manage and be up to and equal to the burdens of, of everyday life right now. 
And perhaps in verse 8, some people, I don't know about us, but some may be, even despairing, beginning to lose hope, beginning to feel a, a powerful sense of discouragement in the present circumstances. Now, look, if that's true of us, this was true about the Apostle Paul. And this is why we love the Apostle Paul. He doesn't allow for a second any nonsense about being a superhero. He is not a superhero, the Apostle Paul. He's not one of these false prophets who, who try and make out that they gleam with whiteness and brightness all the time. He's emphasizing weakness and, and struggle. And here he is saying, I want you to know the struggle I felt in Asia. Verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us and in whom we trust, he will still deliver us. When he says there in verse nine, 2 Corinthians 1 verse nine, that he had the sentence of death in himself. You're not quite sure what, what that was. We don't know if it was some form of physical problem. We don't know if it was persecution. We don't know if it was accident. But Paul reached a point where he genuinely believed his life had come to an end. In that moment, Paul lifted his gaze to God. And in lifting his gaze to God, what did he think about? He thought about the resurrection. Now, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because if you and I were at the point, you know, and let's pray we never will be in this, in this crisis anyway. If we're at this point where we think, right, that's it. My life is, is at an end now. What would you think about? And many of us as Christians may think about the love of God, that his love for me was expressed in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's great. What Paul does is he thinks about the resurrection. And he remembers that God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. He is the God of resurrection. And in thinking about that, Paul places his confidence in the God of the resurrection. And in placing that confidence, Paul experiences the confidence of a believer in God. So the promise of resurrection is to do with the right moment. And if you think about that just for a second, the timing of the resurrection is, is wonderful, really, because the disciples had given up hope. The, the women who went to the tomb went in expectation of preparing the body for burial. You get the sense that all the disciples weren't expecting the resurrection, even though Jesus had said, and as the angel who meets the women in Matthew 28 reminded them, Jesus had told them he would be raised from the dead. But nonetheless, nobody seems to be expecting it. And uh, one of the most amazing things about Matthew 28 is that Jesus had arranged a mountain in Galilee where he would meet the disciples following his death. Now imagine that. Imagine Jesus saying, now look, after I'm raised from the dead, go to this mountain and I'll meet you there. So he planned where he would meet them, but they were still not expecting that Jesus would be raised from the dead. The moment of the resurrection is a moment that nobody expected. And that's the promise of resurrection. Resurrection occurs when you don't expect it. Because God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. So the trumpet will sound when we don't expect it. And if you think about our congregations, we're not expecting them to grow, are we? We're not expecting many people to be 
brought out of their dead state in trespasses and sins. We don't have much expectation that things are going to get better. We, we are people who don't expect that a living God will show the fact he's a living God and will show his power and will show that he is the God of today as much as he has ever been. The moment of the resurrection is the moment of least expectation. And you know, this idea that you've got to have faith in order for God to do something. That's not what the resurrection shows. Nobody was outside praying. Nobody was saying in their upper rooms, let's pray that God would fulfill his promise that Jesus would be raised from the dead. Nobody was. They were given over to discouragement. They were consumed by doubt. But God expressed his word of power, raising Jesus when nobody was expecting it. That's the promise of resurrection. So we've had the purpose of resurrection. It says, says that God is the living God. And we've had the power of the resurrection. And then the promise of the resurrection. The resurrection will be at that moment of least expectation, where we have a demonstration of the fact that our God is the living God. So I should have started with this really, but what does the word itself mean? The Greek word? We get the, the, the a name of a girl from the Greek word. And uh, for some reason, I always think of Russian royalty uh, when you think of the Greek word. So the girl's name we get is Anastasia uh, from the Greek for resurrection. And uh, the, the meaning of the word resurrection is to put somebody back on their feet. And that's what we all need, don't we? We need to get back on our feet. Our country needs to get back on its feet. The Church of Jesus Christ needs to get back on our feet. And it may be that you and I right now, we feel, don't we? We just need to get back on our feet. We may feel the burden of every day, the struggle of, of self-isolation. We want to get back on our feet. Well, that's what the resurrection is all about, is getting back on your feet. Because God is the living God. The power of God is at work in us. And the promise of the resurrection is one that we can all take and hold on to. So everyone, happy Easter.